Um, so yeah, I, again, I, I sort of oversee the delivery of um, the Southwest Peatland Partnership. Um, and when I started uh, in Peatland Restoration over sort of uh, 20 years ago, uh, it tended to be just a, a bunch of uh, ecologists standing in a field uh, or on a peatland environment deciding uh, what it was we wanted to do. Um, but as you can see, uh, things have moved on since then, thankfully. Uh, and uh, we now have this massive partnership. So the Southwest Peatland Partnership, um, yeah, it's got over 22 organizations, you know, all the names you can, can see there. And it's such a wide remit uh, of people who are involved in, in, in the partnership, you know, from private uh, industry like Southwest Water, who employ me to, to, to do this uh, project. Uh, all, all the way through to, you know, sort of farmers, individuals and, and, and landowners like the Duchy of Cornwall, uh, on, ex, uh, on Dartmoor. Um, and so, yeah, it just brings this much sort of uh, broader uh, interest uh, and partnership and experience and knowledge uh, to, to our work and, and makes it a much more rounded sort of delivery that we have. some reason I'm just having sorry about this it just seems to be not moving along to the next slide okay I might have to do it that way I'll uh -oh, see if it will touch in in a minute um, uh, but yeah, so un uh, and then under the umbrella of the Southwest Peatland Partnership, um, there are three uh, uh, local uh, peatland partnerships uh, and then us to sort of uh, discuss and think about uh, all the sort of local uh, considerations and areas uh, for peatland restoration. Uh, and you can see under the Dartmoor Peatland Partnership, again, there's, a, there's over 18 organisations that sit in that partnership and help with those discussions and steer delivery. Uh, and it's a really broad, uh, you know, organisations and representation that comes to that uh, and just, um, yeah, makes for a, yeah, a, a much better approach towards peatland restoration and getting everyone on board and everyone understanding and enabling their input into to what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, where, where is the Southwest Peatland Partnership working? So we work uh, from Exmoor to Dartmoor to Bodmin Moor and all the way down to uh, West Penwith now. Uh, and um, we've, we've been working on Exmoor since yeah, 1998 and things have just grown from there really. So, you know, in 2010, uh, onwards, there was a pilot partnership, a pilot project on Dartmoor, and um, that did some work around sort of Winnie's Down uh, and a small area on Amicum. And now we've really grown on Dartmoor as well. Uh, and you can see the little uh, blobs on the red are, are all the sites on Dartmoor where we, we're currently working or looking to work into the future. Yeah, and how, how are we funded? Uh, so we've been mainly funded by, uh, since 1998 by Southwest Water, uh, the Environment Agency, Natural England, uh, and, and DEFRA. Uh, and at the moment, our, our biggest funder is, is Southwest Water and uh, um, Natural England, but we also have match funding through works and yes it is a good problem, but it, I think it highlights that you know nature conservation and uh, nature conservation you know they don't it doesn't come cheaply and nor should it come uh, be thought of as being done on the cheap um, but we're also wanting to understand uh, about our restoration whether it's worth 
working or not working or, or can we improve it? What do we actually know about the peatlands in the southwest? So we have a, a, a big monitoring and research program. Uh, and as you can see there, it's, it's over about 3.5 million that's been put into or going to put in put towards peatland restoration across the southwest. Uh, yeah, and we work with a whole range of organizations, whether that's Exeter University, the University of Plymouth, uh, and sort of contractors uh, and volunteers to uh, deliver all that monitoring and research. And, and what are the aims of, uh, of the project? Our main aim really is ultimately for the peatlands to restore that hydrology, to get um, hydrological function back to those peatlands. Uh, but while we're doing that, we, we work holistically to try and uh, think about how we operate as a project. You know, we think about the local economy. Can we employ more local contractors to deliver that work? Uh, can we get our timber supplies uh, from local woodlands around the peatland uh, areas that we're working? You know, how do we impact on farming? You know, we think about access and, and looking to get farmers into agri-environment schemes so they can get a financial benefit from us doing peatland restoration work on, on their land. And again, that's sort of biodiversity. What are the biodiversity gains from, from doing our work? So yeah, it's, it's not just a come in and, and do peatland restoration and not think about anything else. We really try to work holistically and get maximum benefit for a whole suite of sort of uh, services. And what, what have we achieved today? So uh, yeah, across the Southwest uh, since 1998, we've achieved over um, 3000 hectares of peatland restoration. Um, uh, the bulk of that being on Exmoor where we've done around uh, two and a half thousand hectares of, uh, of restoration. Uh, on Dartmoor uh, alone, uh, we've uh, delivered to date around sort of 450 hectares of peatland restoration. Uh, and, and interestingly, that makes up about less than 3% of Dartmoor's peatlands. So that just gives you an idea uh, of the scale of restoration potential for Dartmoor, really. Uh, and, and what are we doing now? And what, what is our future? Where, what are we do, where are we working? So in September of last year, we were successful in uh, Southwest Water Applied on behalf of the Southwest Peatland Partnership to Natural England's uh, Nature for Climate uh, grant. Uh, and we were successful in securing uh, 9 million uh, for peatland restoration in the Southwest. Uh, and that's been match funded uh, to the um, to around sort of three, four million as well. So we're in this really, really fortunate position where we've got uh, a lot of money going into peatland restoration in the Southwest. And when we, we look at uh, Dartmoor alone, our commitments up until March, 2025 are to look at uh, doing uh, just over 900 hectares of, of peatland restoration. Uh, and yeah, the cost on Dartmoor is about 7 million, but that 7 million is includes the capital works to do the uh, interventions in, in on the ground in the peatlands, uh, but it also in, in includes our staffing uh, and what it's enabled on Dartmoor is for us to go from, a, from one project officer to um, three project officers uh, and a dedicated historic environment officer Whereas in the past, uh, we only had a third of one person's time uh, doing the historic environment for, for Dartmoor. And, and what, it, what it also brings in is a communications officer, engagement officer, and a monitoring team. So uh, lots of things that we were accused of, um, of not really doing in the past, like communications, that this really enables us to do this uh, work. Um, sorry, I just... Oh. My computer is deciding that it, it wants to do its own thing. 
Uh, and, and yeah, again, just to say around the research and monitoring, uh, we've got around a million pounds uh, across uh, for Dartmoor in terms of looking at hydrological, ecological, uh, agriculture and the historic environment uh, monitoring. So, um, yeah. But I'll just take a step backwards, really, and, and like, you know, why are we doing this peatland restoration? Uh, um, and, I, and I think, you know, within the UK, we should be uh, really sort of valuing our, our peatlands. You know, as you can see there, we hold, you know, 20% of the world's resources in, in blanket bog. Uh, that, you know, peatlands in the UK really are our, our sort of diamonds or, you know, equivalent of uh, rainforests. Uh, and, and they are under threat. Uh, you know, there's something like, uh, 22% of the UK is made up of um, peatlands, um, but only around 12% um, of that is actually in re-wetted or, or good condition. So they're, they're heavily degraded uh, and uh, yeah, we should really be valuing them uh, and looking to restore them. But why, why, why are they, you know, in, in the condition uh, that we find them today? And, and it's a real historical sort of story in terms of centuries of, of human intervention on our, on our, on our peatlands. Uh, you know, they've been, you know, drained. Uh, there's a little drainage ditch here on top left. Uh, and these little drainage ditches uh, either, you know, dug to drain the land for agriculture or for peat cuttings or, you know, um, to improve farming uh, on our moorlands. These little drains often turn into uh, big gullies and you can just about make out my colleague who stood in the middle picture. Uh, and just to give you a bit of scale, she's about five foot uh, eight uh, and you can see the gully is, is, is way above her head as well. But you know, the, in these sites, we've had uh, you know domestic peat cutting, and on, on Dartmoor, you've got industrial scale peat cutting happening. The moorlands have been you know burnt; they've been overgrazed, undergrazed. You know, we've had deforestation of, of our uplands as well. You know, Dartmoor's huge military activity that's happened there, and now you know these moorlands, our peatlands, are subject to nitrogen deposition. And, and to climate change and the southwest peatlands, you know, they're the southerly end of Britain and are the most vulnerable to climate change in the UK. And so, and, and what do we think happened? You know, all of that results uh, in the degradation of our peatlands. And this little diagram on the left just helps to illustrate what's happened within our peatlands. Uh, on Dartmoor. So in the past, when it's a, a good functioning peatland, there would have been a hummock and hollow uh, sort of land surface. The water table would have sat near, near to the surface. Um, but as we've gone in and put drainage ditches and cut the peat and, and, and burnt it, and it's, it's all eroding away, and that water table gets lowered and oxygen gets into the system and it, that peat starts to degrade, it starts to be washed away and, and you know, like I was saying what was a little gully suddenly turns into a big gully or we start to see these isolated what we call hags these isolated islands of peat up on the moorland and it's just a sort of uh, downward spiral really in terms of, of, of losing that peat. Um, yeah, and so of all that sort of uh, damage and degradation that's happening, what it means is that the, the sort of the mires uh, and most of the southwest peatlands uh, are no longer functioning properly. The majority of peatlands that here in the southwest are degrading uh, and they're now emitting carbon. So whereas a, a good functioning peatland should be able to store carbon. Uh, we know from our research that most of the southwest peatlands are emitting carbon. Um, this also has an impact on water quality. So uh, we see that dark color when you turn, when you look at the Dartmoor rivers is, is all the peat being washed uh, uh, down into those rivers. And then has means that 
we're not storing as much water up on the moor as well. It's just quickly going down those ditches, down those gullies and into the river underway and not being stored up in the moorland in the peatland. And that again has a knock on in terms of biodiversity. So we can see from several reports, you know, state of the nation, the state of the UK, state of the park, you know, we see a huge decline, you know, in, in, in the habitats and on the species that are associated with, with peatlands. And then from a historic environment point of view as well, you know, this erosion of the peat means that features uh, are exposed, uh, open to the elements, and also the paleo environmental resource it, that's stored in peatlands. So all that, those pollen grains and insects that sit within that peat are all being washed away or degraded and, and being, being lost. And then from a farming point, that peat being washed away is meaning that they're actually, you know, they're physically losing their soil. And, and you can see on a lot of the Dartmoor uh, sort of moorland, the blanket bog, we now have this expanse of purple moor grass. And, and that's a sort of uh, a result of the degradation of the peatland and nitrogen deposition. Uh, and that purple moor grass is only sort of palatable for livestock between sort of May, June and July. Uh, and after that, um, you know, stock don't really want to eat it. And again, on, from a landscape point of view, uh, this erosion and degradation of the peatlands means that as a habitat and a landscape, they're not resilient. They, they're not able to adapt to, to climate change. Um, and what do we know about uh, Dartmoor? We're, we're in terms of the peatland extent and depth. We're in this really fortunate position uh, on, on Dartmoor where the University of Exeter did a, a, a big sort of uh, research project for us. Uh, and all this information is available on the Dartmoor National Park website. But from their research, we know uh, the extent of peatland on Dartmoor. So there's around, you know, 15,000 uh, uh, hectares of peaty soil uh, of uh, above uh, 0.4 meters thick and that 0.4 meters thick is uh, as a sort of soils classification peatland classification anything below uh, sort of half a meter is not really considered to be peat uh, uh, but anything above is so and within that sort of uh, peaty soil, there could be around 3.1 mega, megatons of carbon stored up, stored on Dartmoor. Uh, and, and that's, you know, equivalent to 10% of UK's sort of 2018 greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and as part of this uh, uh, research uh, that the university did, they, they, they provided uh, this amazing resource in terms of, they mapped apps, all the features, uh, erosion features. So these little maps on the right, they show uh, all the features. So uh, the red uh, there on slide B is, um, all the drainage ditches uh, that have gone in, um, and then there's uh, the blue, oh, actually I can't, yeah, I sort of move my cursor a bit. Let me move this a bit, yep. Ooh, get my, yep, so the, the red is the, yeah, the drainage ditches. Uh, the blue is uh, where there's bare peat. Uh, the yellow is where there's gullies. Uh, and the green is where they're peat cutting. So, so this amazing resource that we have now that's enabling us to uh, know where all the erosion features are and, and really helps with our planning for, for the restoration. Um, and and our, as part of their, their research, uh, they look, you know, looked at the peatland extent uh, and, and one of the sort of uh, quite alarming sort of statistics that came out of their research is that there's only around 360 hectares of functionally intact blanket bog on Dartmoor. Uh, and you think there's probably around, uh, what was it, what did I ask, what was my figure? 50, yeah, over 15,000 hectares of peatland, peatland on Dartmoor. Um, so that's, yeah, it's really alarming that there's only 360 hectares intact. And, and when we looked at that peatland extent and looked at our current rate of work, 
uh, we worked out that it would take us about 65 to 70 years to restore all of all of Dartmoor's peatlands. So uh, when we got to try and meet our carbon commitments by 2030 or 2050, uh, yeah, there's a there's something that's not quite aligning. And so how, how do we go about doing, doing our work? So every site that we're looking to do peatland restoration on, we have to do a whole uh, raft of consultation uh, around the works. So with landowners and tenants and uh, farmers and commoners, uh, and um, we have to draw up a restoration plan for that site as well. Uh, but just to put in context again as well, the, the sort of planning process uh, can take around two to five years uh, to do. And I think that's something that everyone always underestimates and particularly funders underestimate. You know, they think they give you a pot of money and you can go off and do this work. Uh, uh, but it takes a long time to get everyone in agreement to do the works. Uh, and that's the hardest part of, of my job, really, is getting everyone to be in agreement about what we're, what we're wanting to do on the sites. Uh, and, but, and on the flip side of that, the practical work, depending on the scale of the site we're working on, can take anything from a week to six months. So, uh, um, yeah, and as part of the restoration plan, uh, when we're looking at a site, we look at the features that we want to block. So these two little uh, pictures that you can see are taken from LIDAR data uh, and they really highlight as well. Uh, so we can overlay the university's layers on there, but what they also highlight to us is sort of where all the erosion is. Uh, and we can look at, you know, where those gullies are, where the finger-like dendritic erosion is, where all the peat cuttings are, uh, and we can think about what methods we want to use. It, it makes it it makes us start thinking about the historic environment. You know, what's what is the known archaeology on any site that we want to work on? Uh, and then Martin, our archaeologist, will commission works if we need to do and do desk based sort of studies and on 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 our sites to look at the archaeology and think about commissioning works. We think about the ecology. You know. Are there any European protected species there? Uh, are there any, you know, unknown records there? Uh, and, and what can be the positive uh, fr from our work, really? We then think about access. Uh, you know, how do we get to the site? How do we get staff, other, other contracting staff to the site? How do we, um, you know, think about, you know, access for commoners across these areas, for public rights of way? Uh, and all of these uh, things, and then the landscape implications in terms of our work, you know, we're doing interventions on the ground, we're putting these dams in, you know, we're bringing pools of water back into the landscape, you know, what's, the, what's that, how is that changing the landscape? And again, then we think about the impacts on farming, you know, how are they moving their stock, you know, are there any sort of um, implications around changing uh, their routes to stock move, the routes that they have to drive, uh, and can we help them get into any, any agri-environment schemes as well as a result of our work. And we also have to think about the cost of doing this work and bring that together. Uh, and just to say, uh, the reason I've stuck that little picture in the bottom left there of two guys carrying a square is, is we have to do unexploded ordnance surveys on Dartmoor, and that's the guys surveying for the, for the ordnance. Uh, and the, that basically doubles our costs on Dartmoor as well to get that done. Uh, and then uh, the machinery that we use. So we, again, because we're working on sort of uh, remote locations, peatland locations, wet, wet, wet peat, which can be anything from 50 centimeters up to sort of, uh, you know, seven, eight meters. We have to use specialized machinery. So we use, uh, diggers that have got wide tracks, often ru rubber wide tracks, so that they reduce their ground pressure uh, and they have tilt rotating bucket heads so they don't have to move around as much. 
uh, yeah, and getting staff and some of the materials, we use little gaiters, again, for low ground pressure, so that we're always thinking about reducing our impact on, on the ground. We're also having to think about how we get materials to site. So can we use track dumpers or, you know, some places on Dartmoor, we are having to think about using helicopters to fly materials in. So we think we've got uh, from a roadside to get to the site where we're working, it can be about four miles. And if you think we're taking timber in and out, and uh, then that could be a lot of journeys and a lot of impact on the ground. So we, we have to weigh it up and I know there's a carbon implication in terms of using helicopters and amount of fuel but it's all of these things that we have to try and weigh up really when, when, when we're looking to do our work. And, and, how, and how do we go about doing it? What are the methods that we use uh, to actually block these erosional features? Uh, so we always start from the point of using peat as much as we can uh, and we just make these little peat dams uh, that uh, sort of run uh, along, uh, along the line of uh, a ditch. We basically scoop out a bit of peat, uh, take a borrow pit from, an, from a, a little area to the right or left of, of where we're working, get some fresh peat, put that into the ditch uh, and make a dam and cover that with vegetation. Uh, and, and, and then we move on to do that about another five to seven meters down the ditch or down the erosion feature. Uh, when it starts to get to be a, a bigger uh, erosion feature, like a gully or a, or a big wide peat cutting, uh, then we look to use wood. Uh, so whether that's building a timber dam, like on the bottom uh, bottom right of the screen, uh, we use a, we basically build a wooden uh, dam out of uh, timber planks and posts, and then we cover it with peat uh, so it can't be seen as well. Uh, and we also use timber rounds and we're in this really uh, lovely relationship at the moment with the Woodland Trust where they're doing uh, felling uh, plantations around Dartmoor. They then employ a local uh, um, timber merchant, uh, mill somebody to saw up the timber for us to the size of the planks that we want them and then we uh, just to haul them up onto our sites on Dartmoor so um, thinking about sustainability and where we, was, we source our, uh, our materials from it's a really really good story there. Uh, and one of the other sort of materials that we use is willow. So we start, we're starting to use willow uh, within valley mires or little spring mires, uh, where the method here is uh, more about slowing flows and capturing sediments and also looking to establish some wet woodland within, within these environments as well. Uh, so again, we look to soil as locally as we can. We cut it up into uh, uh, faggots and we make hurdles and put them in or use stakes of live willow just to yeah, get, get it growing, going, slowing the flow. Um, one of our other techniques that, that we've been using up on the Buckfastley Moor and Hole Moor is uh, we've used a flail uh, mower to flail big areas of millennia. Uh, and then we've actually gone in there and planted sphagnum to try and uh, reduce the dominance of millennia and provide this little uh, micro environment that uh, the sphagnums do to get them uh, growing and, and to allow those wet conditions to establish. And we've done some areas where we have mown and planted sphagnum and some areas where we mown and not planted sphagnum so that we can uh, help keep the stock off to some degree as well that um just to give the sphagnum a bit of chance to to establish itself really um and one of the things that we're looking for the future as well is uh, thinking about uh, no fence sort of cattle collars uh, can we establish some sort of mob grazing on the moorlands on these peatlands to really knock back some some of the millennia which is uh, um we think one of the main reasons that the sphagnum doesn't get away, it outcompetes sphag sphagnum uh, and, and some of the bog plants and dries out the peatland environment as well. Uh, so we, we're sort of looking to see if that's a possibility on some of our moorland sites that we're working on. 
So what does it sort of look like? So we have what we call these dendritic finger-like erosion channels right off on the top of the moors mostly. Uh, and they have these bare patches uh, of peat which is are exposed. The water table is low uh, and they're releasing carbon in, into the environment. And then on the right hand side, uh, these isolated little channels can oft often get bigger and bigger as they go down and down the hills and uh, I'm sure all of you will have seen having walked Dartmoor you get these isolated islands peat hags that just sit there and, and are so disconnected uh, to anything else to the hydrology uh, um, that they are just eroding away and then over time will just be 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 lost um, so what we go in and do uh, is uh, put these little dams in, so put the peat dams in, uh, and this is up on uh, uh, Hanging Stone, and you can see, so uh, in the front of the picture, where you've still got those bare bits of uh, peat being shown, we haven't installed any dams, but uh, where we have installed the dams, you get these little pools uh, uh, of water stored behind the dam and showing uh, the difference between where we've worked and not and where we haven't worked. Uh, and this is a, an area uh, up on Amicum above the Rattlebrook. Uh, and this is the old uh, industrial peat works there. And, and the map on the left, all those different coloured uh, lines are all the ditches running across uh, that area uh, of Amicum. Uh, kilometres and kilometres of drainage ditches drying out the, the peat. Uh, and the picture on, on the right hand side uh, with the dashed lines just indicates to you, uh, and I'm sure you'll have all seen this on Dartmoor, all these little lines of ditches that just run across whole landscapes there you know, to dry out the peat, which was then, you know, extracted uh, uh, and is having, you know, massive, massive sort of landscape in, impact on those peatland areas. Yeah, again, you can see where we've done, uh, again, the line of ditches running uh, up uh, on Amicum. That was before we did any work. And then we go along uh, with the diggers, they go in, every five to seven meters, they make a peat dam uh, and we get these pools of water stored behind. So it's really storing the water behind, raising that water table and then pushing the water out across the surface of the land. And then when we move into sort of uh, a wider gullies, uh, one of the options that we have, uh, one of the methods that we use is, is where we've got these vertical faces, uh, where the peat is eroding, it constantly being exposed to the elements. So, you know, uh, the rain comes, it, it, uh, and then if we, in the winter, we get, you know, uh, really cold, you know, uh, spells, the ground freezes, and then it thaws, and you get this cracking of the peat and this slumpage of the peat. Uh, uh, and it just, from a gully, just works out and out and out. Uh, and we'll continue. So one of the things that we do is we come in and we, uh, the digger will take the vegetation off the top, he'll grade the peat, reprofiles it, and then he puts the vegetation back. Uh, and um, you wouldn't know that, you know, that we've been there, but it means that the vegetation is protecting that peatland. Uh, and we also in the bottom put some little, uh, little dams to slow the flow of water as well. Uh, yeah, and again, if the gullies uh, are getting uh, really, really, really deep, we, and we've, we haven't got that opportunity to get the water out of that gully, we have to look at uh, other methods. So uh, if we can, we use the wooden blocks uh, and we cover them with peat. Uh, if we can't get the water out of the gully, then we use uh, what we call leaky wooden dams, uh, and we literally put some little... Uh, notch it on top of the wooden planks and put a splash plate, uh, but that wood is always left exposed. Uh, and yeah, and uh, across Dartmoor, you know, there's just thousands and thousands of hectares of, of peat cuttings. Uh, and, and what we want to try and do on a peat cutting 
uh, is to look for any exit points where we can block. Uh, and uh, we either, if there's the peat available, then we will use peat to make that little, uh, little dam again. Again, it's just literally taking off the vegetation, uh, getting a borrow pit where we can get some fresh peat. We put that into the, in and make the dam and cover that over uh, with uh, vegetation again. And, and one of the things that we consider, uh, you know, because they're historic environment features is, is, uh, looking to make sure that we can keep the edge of the peat face so that anyone in the future can see that this was a peat cutting uh, and also we tend to make our dams in a sort of slight u shape again so someone in the future can can realize that uh, it wasn't it's not a part of the peat cutting process it's an interve intervention afterwards and and one of the things i should say is that so every uh, uh, dam or block that we put in, we GPS. Uh, so we have a, a record of every single feature that we've put into the uh, peatland. Uh, uh, so someone in the future again can can look at our records and, and know that you know uh, you know fifteenth of February twenty twenty two on Prison Farm there were number of peat blocks installed and that's you know will sit there as a record for the future as well where we don't have the peat depth available and we're working on shallow repeat we have to think of alternative methods and so one of the methods that we're using is using timber rounds and the picture on the right is where we've just basically did uh, put two timber rounds side by side across a peat cutting uh, and it, it does the same process as the wooden planks would do but the reason we use the timber rounds is because aesthetically they look slightly better on the landscape uh, and again you can see that it's storing water water behind it uh, yeah and just you know moving on from that to say that you know well uh, we're not just a sort of restoration capital works we do we do a lot of monitoring and research you know on dartmoor alone we've got two hydrological monitoring catchments one on flat tool pan uh, one on uh, hanging stone uh, where we've been working with the university of exeter to do pre and post restoration monitoring um, you know we look at biodiversity you know doing vegetation monitoring bird monitoring um, historic environment uh, you know as i was saying you know martin looks at what what's the known archaeology there and then we're looking to commission works uh, like working with ralph fife at the university of plymouth to uh, look at the paleo environmental sort of uh, um, resource uh, in, on the peatlands of Dartmoor, uh, yeah, and again, we're sort of looking at doing agricultural sort of monitoring now on, on Dartmoor as well. We've done it on Exmoor in the past, but now we're looking to bring that monitoring onto to Dartmoor as well, and and onto Bodmin Moor. Uh, yeah, and we've done greenhouse gas monitoring on on Dartmoor and Exmoor to date as well. So yeah, so some of the the results of uh, of the monitoring uh, and uh, you know one of the sort of most pleasing results for me really is sort of seeing the changes in biodiversity. You know, I come from a sort of ecology background, so when I you know we do the works and you know five minutes after we can see the pools of water being stored in some of these uh, these dams, but then it's it's that season uh, directly after we've come off the moor in March, if we start seeing these uh, birds like snipe and dunlin beginning to use uh, the pools, it's just, you know, it's really, really uh, amazing and rewarding. And, and we can see having done surveys of, of, of wader birds uh, on, on Dartmoor and Exmoor, uh, we can see direct correlation between uh, increased number of snipe and dunlin associated with our with our restoration uh, and again you know we do the research uh, around invertebrates as well and it doesn't you know you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know as soon as you put water into what was a dry environment you start to see increases in the aquatic invertebrates you know so you know we see more dragonflies 
you know, there's more frog spawn out on the moorland, uh, you know, and that all has a knock on effect really in terms of that sort of whole food chain and biodiversity. Uh, but it's just, you know, so amazing to see uh, to see these changes happening and they can be quite dramatic as I was saying within what a season of us having done the restoration we begin to see these changes happening uh, and we yeah we've been doing vegetation monitoring so uh, on Dartmoor we've been doing uh, vegetation monitoring uh, working with the University of Plymouth and, and volunteers some of you might have been out doing the the, the um, vegetation monitoring with one of my colleagues David or the University of Plymouth uh, and we've been you know put in vegetation transects before we did any restoration and, and then we've surveyed those sites uh, post restoration uh, and um, from the research on Dartmoor uh, we can see that you know there's a significant increase in, in this sort of uh, uh, plant species associated uh, with uh, with Myers and our restoration. So, and I've just put in, the, I, I sometimes hate putting in graphs because people, you know, you, you look at them and it's like, what, what's that graph telling me? But from this graph, the, the positive things to take away from it really are the, the sort of red line and the blue line uh, where we're seeing uh, pre-restoration 2011, an increase in, in sphagnum species. Uh, and those are the, the, the plants that we definitely want to see coming back into the into the peatlands on Dartmoor. If we're getting more sphagnums, sphagnum and 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 plants act as a proxy for hydrological restoration. So if we're seeing those sort of plants coming back into into the moorland, back into the peatland, we know that we've got the hydrology right, and we're beginning to see those positive changes really. Um, and and. Uh, so yeah, again, it's another positive story. But just to say, uh, like, so it, it also depends on the depth of the peat. The deeper the peat, the better our, our peatland restoration works, and the quicker the changes uh, happen. On shallow peat, it can be quite variable. So uh, some of the restoration results have shown that it takes between seven and ten years to to start to see plant community change. Uh, and uh, so it, it can be a much longer process. Um, it, and in terms of the sort of water storage uh, on Dartmoor, it's a really, really positive story. So um, this is up on Flat Torpan, uh, where we've got one of our hydrological monitoring stations. And, and the little diagram below the picture on, on the left is pre-restoration. So it's showing all these different channels, how they start up on the plateau, this finger like channels, and they all run down into one big gully. And that's where the water is going. Uh, you know, as you know, water takes the quickest route away, goes into these channels and runs off the moorland, off the peatland areas. Uh, and when we do the restoration by putting in all these little dams, and getting these pools of water, what we're doing is we're changing the way that water moves across the, the landscape and the way the way it's uh, it's stored. Uh, so rather than the water heading down these little channels, it, it's going it it's now going overland because we've pushed it up out of these channels, uh, and it's also um, changing how water moves uh, underneath uh, as well. And what we can see from the monitoring uh, up on flat tall pan uh, that the, the amount of water running down through one gully uh, was uh, reduced by 66% after we'd done our restoration. So that's a really dramatic change in terms of uh, storing more water up on the moors and, and it leaving the moors more slowly. Again, another well, yeah, horrible graph, but uh, Basically, this is looking at the water tables uh, up, up on flat Torpan, and what we can see uh, on the left is pre-restoration data. So the water table is sitting predominantly below the water surface, and it and it's uh, throughout this as the season changing changes, it's dropping dramatically, sort of to below sort of. 20 centimeters below the surface of the ground. Whereas then when we come in and do the restoration, uh, we can see that for most of the year, uh, we can see that the water table sits 
above that ground surface. We've got those pools of water uh, and the maximum water level is sitting above, above uh, the ground surface. Uh, and we can see that we're having an increase uh, in the average water table by around sort of two, two centimeters. Uh, and we're, we're sort of uh, storing the amount of water there for longer. Uh, and we're not getting those real fluctuations in the water table. Uh, the water quality story, uh, which interestingly, as considering I'm employed by a water company, is, is not such a, a, a positive story to, to date, in that we'd hope to see uh, a, a much bigger change in terms of the amount of dissolved organic carbon, so that peat dark, what makes our water that dark peaty colour, that dissolved organic carbon, we were hoping to see a significant change in the amount of dissolved organic carbon uh, sort of going into the water treatment works. Uh, and, and that, although that hasn't been, hasn't seen, what we know is that we are reducing significantly the total amount of, uh, of discharge. So by reducing the amount of water that's going into the, into the rivers, we're reducing the, the total load uh, of, uh, of dissolved organic carbon that's going into our rivers. So there's a, there's a positive in that respect, really. And what we're seeing is a change in the chemical composition of that uh, or dissolved organic carbon that's coming into, into the sort of water treatment works and through our monitoring. In that, where in the past, when the water table dropped really low, low the source of the carbon was from deep uh, from the hags uh, and deeper in the peatland system. Whereas now, because we've uh, raised the water table, the carbon that's been released is is fresher, newer carbon, the carbon nearer the, nearer the top. So, um, so that's the sort of change that we're seeing, and I think it's a, a sort of wait and see and, and, and looking at our data that's coming out compared to other sort of national peatland restoration projects. It's the same process, but there's got to be a much longer term in terms of seeing significant change in, in the amount of dissolved organic carbon leaving the, the moors as a result of our sort of restoration. We're also uh, doing uh, greenhouse gas monitoring. So looking at the sort of carbon flux that happens from, from our peatlands, again, working with the University of Exeter. Uh, and, and what we can uh, definitely tell from our monitoring uh, on Dartmoor and on Exmoor that our peatlands here in the, uh, on Dartmoor and Exmoor are currently uh, sources uh, of carbon dioxide. So they're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, adding to that sort of greenhouse gas effect really. Uh, and from our monitoring, five, uh, from the university's monitoring five years after um, we've, done, we've done the restoration, what we can see, uh, unfortunately, is, is no significant cha change in uh, greenhouse gas uh, sort of net ecosystem exchange. Uh, that is because we've seen an, an increase in, in um, species like cotton grass, uh, uh, and, and, and that is enabling another uh, sort of um, process to happen. So uh, uh, in terms of having more methane being released, it's allowing methan methanogens to start working within the peatland, and so we are seeing an increase in uh, sort of methane release and from some of other research that's been done on Exmoor it looks like it takes seven to ten years again to see a, a sort of natural change or back to a natural cycle for the sort of uh, a carbon and methane to sort of settle back down to what, what a, a, a functioning peatland should be like. Um, and yet, so in terms of the historic environment, uh, you know, we've been doing research and monitoring around uh, around our work and the historic environment. So one of uh, the, the big tools that we use is, is using LIDAR data to uh, look at uh, the land surface. Uh, often some of the, the features uh, out on the landscape are incredibly difficult to see uh, using the, you know, the human eye. You can walk across the landscape and, you know, on Dartmoor and on and Exmoor and Bodmin and not and think, oh, you're just walking across a little bumpy ground. But then when you start looking at the LIDAR data, you, 
you get to see uh, that all these little humps and bumps are where there used to be peat cuttings and it enables us to see barrows and a whole array of different features that were unknown uh, previously. And, and one of Martin's jobs is to collate all that data and then send it to the historic environment record centers and, and they can uh, put that data into their databases and, and update their, uh, their, their understanding of those areas. Uh, and we're also looking uh, and been using uh, drone technology to take high resolution photographs uh, and, and we use that to sort of monitor the state of uh, the sort of uh, the landscape before we do any restoration uh, and uh, and then we will refly those areas and we can see how that's changed as well so again it's just trying to look at different ways of using technology to understand the, the historic environment and, and and see the impacts of our work and again like I was saying, we record where every block is that we've installed, every dam that we've installed, so we can overlay that information onto the LIDAR data, onto photographs, and really get an idea of, of how we've impacted the historic environment positively and negatively. Uh, and part of our work as well around the historic environment, you know, um, where areas are eroding and, and the peat is exposing features like like tram uh, the old tramway tracks uh, we've worked carefully with uh, uh, the park archaeologists to sort of think about that uh, and do some reprofiling to sort of the peatland areas to protect those features that are submerged uh, within within the peat and there are some areas which you know if the archaeology is considered of significant importance you know that then we will put uh, exclusion areas around those so like the barrow that you can see on that LIDAR data on the photograph on the top, uh, uh, and top left, bottom left, um, it, we would put an exclusion area around that so we wouldn't be able to work anywhere near that or drive machinery around that. Um, so yeah, we're sort of really enhancing our knowledge around the archaeology and the historic environment of, of, of our uplands. Um, yeah, we also monitor landscape. So we've got uh, yeah around sort of twenty fixed point uh, photograph uh, locations across Dartmoor, and about another sixty across uh, Exmoor, uh, and we take pre-restoration photographs, uh, and they act as a base uh, of uh, what uh, the landscape looked uh, before we went and done uh, went and did any restoration and then we will come back and retake those photographs you know three years down the line or someone can use those photographs 50 years down the line and to retake them uh, in those exact locations and see the changes in terms of our our, our work really on on the landscape um, but just to say in terms of uh, landscape change you know we we are wanting to see landscape change as a result of our work by physically doing an intervention and looking to change the flora uh, on that landscape, we want to see change uh, and we hope it, it, it's a positive landscape change that people see when they go out walking in these areas. And, and this picture here is just taken from, uh, it's up at Red Lake, uh, up from the spoil heap, looking down and, and the two little specks of green right in the centre are where our, our, our diggers are were happy and, and I think it's a, a put that picture really in, in context of you know these aren't wilderness, wildernesses that we're working on uh, they are industrial landscapes and and uh, and got a whole heritage of human intervention so you know we are just one part of that story really in terms of making a landscape change uh, and just a few final slides, to, you know, to say about our future, what, what we're looking to do is to do some more uh, uh, community engagement and understanding, do more out, outreach, get more communities involved in our, in our, in our work. We're going to be doing more research and monitoring, you know, uh, trying to understand impacts on agriculture, particularly on Dartmoor more. Uh, we're looking to get more local contractors involved uh, in terms of delivering the work. Uh, and we're looking to set up a sort of apprenticeship so that we can build sort of next generation of peatland practitioners, contractors, archaeologists, farmers. And that, so that's part of our work for the next three and a half years. 
Uh, yeah, and just a, a final thought for me, really, uh, you know, I mentioned it at the beginning, you know, nature-based solutions, uh, they're not easy. They, they do take uh, a lot of time uh, and a lot of thought goes into, into our work. Uh, and it isn't cheap and it shouldn't be thought of as being done cheaply. Uh, and it's not, a, peatland restoration is not a one-off capital intervention. We do have to come back in and do, do, do works. We need to be thinking on a bigger catchment scale. So working from the blanket bogs all the way down to the valley mires. Uh, we try to, uh, you know, uh, think about, about how our work at the top of the catchment is impacting further down the catchment. We're always honest and open about our work, you know, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and, and looking to improve on how we do our work and how we, how we uh, approach our work. Uh, our restoration methods change, you know, they, they adapt, uh, and we're always looking for new and innovative ways to do our, to do our work. Uh, and just a final thought, really, in terms of the fact that we are in a climate emergency, uh, and we all have a, a responsibility in terms of uh, what we do. So next time you're at the garden centre, make sure that you're buying peat-free compost. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maura. Very enjoyable. John, should we uh, unmute you and uh, hand over to you for the uh, Q&A session, if we may? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Simon. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, just looking through the uh, questions. The first one is from uh, P.F. Joyce. Uh, what's happening in Somerset, notably the levels? Um, and uh, surely that's the southwest. The, the southwest is included in that, or is it not? Yes, yes. Sir. So yes, yeah, so my southwest is mainly southwest Uplands. So yes, I should say that. Uh, but yes, so Somerset is included. So uh, on Exmoor, we do work a little bit. We do work mainly in Somerset, but to the Somerset levels. So there is a Somerset. Somerset Peatland Partnership, which is uh, looking mainly at the Somerset level. So there is another project working there doing that work. And we do link up and talk to them. And it's only at the initial stages. Uh, and I know they've got yeah, a, lot, a lot to do and a lot to discuss there, really. Is peat still being uh, farmed from the Somerset levels? Yes, it ha yes, it is. Yeah. So that's a whole nother ball game in terms of uh, yeah, thinking about peat and extraction and 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 in my opinion, stopping peatland extraction and looking for the alternatives for what those contractors, what those businesses could be doing. You know, can we help those businesses go into polluter culture where they start, uh, you know, growing the sphagnum and the bog plants that we need for some of these restoration areas? You know, can they be the, you know, the contractors who start doing the restoration? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Poach turned gamekeeper, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is from Elizabeth. Uh, and uh, what is the cause of nitrogen uh, deposition? So uh, uh, a lot of uh, causes, really, uh, whether that's from uh, industrial uh, sort of um, uses um, to, uh, you know, you know, a whole that's a whole gamut, really, uh, of 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 sort of uses that that have, that's happening in and and it's sort of mainly yeah mainly from from industry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, this is from Linda Linda Corkerton. Uh, how did they choose the sites uh, which uh, uh, when so much was degraded? I think you covered that uh, uh, to a large extent. Um, uh, yeah, do you want to expand on that at all? Yeah, so we, we used we used the university's uh, data to look where the uh, sort of intact blanket bog was, and we tried to focus our areas around there to try and protect those areas. So uh, starting out from from there to protect them, uh, and some of it is also around 
uh, land ownership and tenants that are willing to do the work as well. So that's sort of focused where we've done some of our work. I suppose there's a whole algorithm about ease of access and, and cost uh, versus benefit. Yeah. Uh, have you got a cost benefit model at all that you, you run through? <laughs> sort of, sort of, uh, uh, sort of, to, yeah. We sort of, but <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it's it's an interesting one, really, because uh, we basically, you know, when you think about Dartmoor, we, we kind of have to do the work, and 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 we want to sort of yeah work from those intact areas out, uh, and um, yeah, we, we, we sort of. I think if you looked at it from a purely economical point of view, you might say, oh, well, we wouldn't do it. But when you weigh up all the other benefits around car potential carbon saving, biodiversity gains and all of that, and you look at that in the whole, in yeah. the round, then it becomes a more viable option, really. Yeah, yeah. More holistic approach, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, is peat cutting still taking place? Uh, and what purpose is the peat being used for? Uh, is this mostly garden uh, garden peat? So that, down down in, uh, in the southwest, so there are still people, uh, I know of people on uh, sort of around Bobman Moor area that are still cutting peat. Uh, and up, on, uh, up in Scotland, uh, they still cut peat. It's mainly on a domestic scale now, and it's used, you know, it's dried out and used as a, their fuel source. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. Um, do you need planning consent? Do you have any statutory powers, e.g. compulsory purchase, to enable works to happen? No, so uh, we, we don't uh, have any statutory powers to purchase land. All our work has to be done in... in uh, consent of the landowner uh, to do that work. I mean, often the land that we're working on is either a triple SI or an SAC or, or it's within an agri-environment scheme. And under that environment scheme, uh, they've got obligations to do the peatland restoration. So we come along as a mechanism to help do that work that it would it would be required of them, yeah. whether that you know because of um, getting a triple SI back into favourable condition or it's within their agri environment scheme. Uh, what there was another part to that question, wasn't there? Around planning, so yeah. no, we don't we don't have to go through the planning process. Right. Okay. Uh, how much of the land is Dutchy land? Is a lot of it? Uh, yes, I think uh, in terms of. The work that we're looking to do in the next four years uh, on Dartmoor uh, is probably about 80% is Dutchy land. Right, right, okay. And presumably they're um, amenable to this to this work, supportive of it. Yeah, so the, the Dutchy is very supportive of the works. They're one of the partners uh, on, on Dartmoor uh, and they're actually um, contributing funds as well uh, to oh. the works this year, this, this, this grant period. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, do, uh, has the link between air pollution and peatland loss been proven? Uh, has it been proven? That's a very good question. Uh, I would say more so in the northern peatlands, when you think about uh, sort of the peak district and areas like that, where as a result of industrial pollution, uh, you know, the atmospheric pollution that's landed on the peatlands around there, it's resulted in, uh, in, in bare peat. You know, they don't even have, you know, they don't have the issue that we have of millennia dominated peatlands. They just have bare peat. And that's all directly related to the industrial sort of pollution that's come, up, come from the cities around those areas. So would I would that say, be acid rain? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in that respect, yes, it has been, it, it has been researched and, and acknowledged. Um, another one here, have other native plants, for instance, bracken, had an effect on peat, peatlands? 
So bracken tends to be there where it's uh, the shallower peats, and you can see that it is, if it's there, it's shallow and it's drying out. And yes, its rhizomes will have have the same effect as as millennia does. You know, they go deeper into the ground yeah. and would have that same drying out effect. But I think. You know, when you've got to the state where you've got bracken, then yeah, it's really shallow degraded. Uh, it would be a very shallow degraded peatland. Um, and again, I think, I'm not sure whether we cover this or not. You mentioned that nitrogen enrichment was one contributor to peatland de degradation. How does the nitrogen reach the high moor? So ma mainly through through um, you know atmospheric pollution. Atmospheric. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what does uh, lidar stand for? Oh, uh, oh, that's going to challenge me. Uh, light <laughs> emitting. Oh, I'd have to Google it. I can't. I can't remember now. Light emitting. Oh, somebody get. I'll, I'll I'll Google as we as we talk. Uh, it's not laser in there, is it? No, oh, um, but it basically, uh, in terms of the process, a plane flies across the uh, across a la an area of land. It sends a, a a beam of light down, and it's the the length of time that it takes to rebound and go back up, uh, right. which then gives the topographical surface ground uh, okay. uh, structure that we saw in some of those pictures. Right. Okay. So it's it's radar, but using light instead. Effectively, is that right? I'm just gonna I'm gonna Google it now that somebody's asked me that. One of those things that you like. Oh, I've forgotten. It's what. Light light detection and ranging works in a similar way to radar. Oh, thank you. Only, right. Only it uses it uses lasers to judge distances and depth. Right. That allows augmented reality pictures to be taken. <laughs> I thought there were lasers in there somewhere. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, another another one from Elizabeth. How do seasons affect interventions such as flooding and drought? Is is that in relation to like when we can work or how we do our work? Well, I, yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, I would. <laughs> Assume it would be that. Uh, yeah. So our, our work. So we we always we we can only work uh, August through to March. Uh, so we avoid the ground nesting bird season. Uh, the the only time we really really can't work is if we get heavy snowfalls uh, and we can't see where the ditches are or where the peat cuttings are. That that's the one thing that really stops us from working. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. This this coming week's going to be a challenge, is it not? With uh, yeah, two storms when, forecast. Yeah, when it's raining uh, a, a lot, it it just becomes unpleasant out there, and then we have to think about how much tracking we're doing and, and any disturbance in, uh, in that respect. And we do have to make a call around that really. And it's generally where we're parking cars and the things that we sort of start to. Um, uh tear up the ground a little bit yeah. so one of the considerations we then have is we use bog mats to sort of have for parking areas or if we need to get across a certain area to reduce our impact so yeah yeah all these factors um uh, this is from tom morris wonderful talk very heartening we all need to hear about your work considering how the vast majority of visitors to dartmoor stay no more than a few yards uh from the car park few will be aware of what you're doing. You mentioned before going on uh, air that uh, access to the areas uh, can be very difficult and weather conditions extremely challenging. Um, a huge, oh, a th huge thank you. And uh, that's just reiterating what you've just said about uh, difficulty getting access and parking cars and uh, degradation of the, uh, of the moor. Um, yeah, I mean, just in terms of, you know, it, it's a very good point about, you know, our work, it tends to be in the sort of remoter areas of Dartmoor. So for your average visitor to Dartmoor who, who maybe doesn't go out there, it, it is one of our things that we, uh, we would like to really work on in terms yeah. of 
you know, communicating that this work is happening on Dartmoor. And hopefully by having a sort of communications uh, officer and an education and engagement officer, we can start doing that, that piece of work and, and getting uh, our message out there in terms of what's happening on Dartmoor and, and looking at how we can make or get people out to some of these sites to have a look yeah. at it and 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 that's what we're really hoping to sort of improve on over the next uh, next three years and beyond awareness like talks like this i guess and yeah uh, yeah and you know making more of you know yeah social media and and all those sorts of virtual sort of uh, avenues that there are today but but also you know there's nothing like getting people out onto a site to actually, you know, look at it and enjoy it and, and understand yeah. what, what's below their feet, you know, because uh, I think peatlands are quite a hard sort of habitat environment for people to understand and, yeah. and appreciate. You know, everyone knows what a woodland is. They can get into a woodland. They know what trees are. Yeah. But really, to get people to think about peatlands, you know, they, they have to, you have to stop them and let, get them to look at their feet and get them to look at the little colourful sphagnums and, yeah. you know, the sundews and all of it. Uh, all of those plants and 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 explain it a bit more you know because it's often yeah. described as these wastelands and will you know and it, it it's just really getting people to get involved in them a lot more well it's a bit like moss and lichens that uh, the, the more you look the, the the smaller the scale you look at the more wonderful they appear yeah uh, yeah um, given the scale of the problem being faced, is there likely to be any scaling up of the project to cover large areas? Uh, would, uh, would it re require central government funding? Uh, yeah. So, so part of, so the funding that we've got for the next three three and a half years is basically from DEFRA. So it is right. it is, it is there government, is there is government funding. Uh, uh, and yes, it, uh, it would take a really, really uh, significant uh, input of money and upscaling. So one of the one of the difficulties that we've got on, at the moment on Dartmoor is actually having con contractors who've got the right machinery uh, to to do the work. So that's part of our legacy building for the next uh, again within this project is to uh, really work with. Uh, you know, local contractors around Dartmoor, whether that's, you know, an agricultural contractor or somebody who's doing some, you know, I don't know, work elsewhere, who's got diggers and, and maybe has slightly seasonal work and they could then come and work for us and, you know, between Mark, uh, August and, and March. So yeah, yes. if anyone knows anyone who does, who might be interested in getting involved in that sort of work, please point them in my direction because we really want to try and get more. Uh, that That is one of our blockers in terms of the amount of restoration we can do is just not having the contractors available to do yeah. the work. Yeah, yeah, with the skills and the equipment, et cetera, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Tasmin says, uh, Tasmin Quinn says, thank you, Maura. Great talk. Very informative and nice to see you again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I think that wraps it up for the questions. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Maura. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maura. It was an excellent talk. And as you can tell by the uh, interested in the feedback from our audience, they obviously find it fascinating as well. So thank you for all your efforts and we very much appreciate it. And uh, hopefully you'll uh, be able to come back and talk to us again at some stage. Uh, and actually, as, as, as you mentioned, it maybe there might be potential also for some of our members to come and visit some of your sites and uh, spread the word that way. Perhaps if we could liaise with you over that, then that, that would be a great opportunity for us. Yeah, no, I was going to say that. Yes, if you'd like to have a you know a site visit out in you know in, in the summertime, then that would yeah. be fantastic to get people out there to see oh, some of our work. Oh. Yeah. We we do we do run um, a regular program of, of uh, summer visits to various different sites, and that would be a great addition to our list. That'd be fantastic. So yeah, great. brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.